when Russia invaded Afghanistan, we called it aggression. Uh, we didn't ask, is it going to succeed or isn't it going to succeed? I mean, there was a debate in Russia, you could read it in Pravda in the early 1980s, as to whether it made sense to invade Afghanistan or whether it was a strategic blunder. We didn't call that a serious debate on principle. We just said, uh, similarly, after Stalingrad, I'm sure there was a debate in the German general staff as to whether a two-front war was a mistake or whether it was the right thing to do. Uh, we don't regard that as a principled debate. When the US invaded Iraq, there are two positions. One is noble cause. Uh, the other is a strategic blunder. That's, for example, Obama said, no, it's a mistake, it's a strategic blunder. But we consider that deeply principled. We cannot ask ourselves the question that we instantly raise when Russia invades Afghanistan. Is it aggression? Is it a war crime? Uh, is it what the Nuremberg Tribunal described as the supreme international crime, which encompasses within it all of the evil that follows? We do do that automatically when say Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait or when uh, uh, Russia invaded Afghanistan or when, any, or when the Russians invaded Hungary. That's the question we ask. When we commit massive crimes, th these questions are unthinkable. I mean, that's, I can't even call that propaganda. That's a matter of indoctrination so profound that the facts of the world become like the eerie air you breathe. You can't even see them. Let's take 9-11. It's another interesting case of indoctrination. I mean, 9-11 was bad enough. It could have been worse. But let's imagine. Suppose that uh, Al-Qaeda had bombed the White House, killed the president, installed a military dictatorship, which killed thousands of people and tortured tens of thousands. Uh, established a, a major international terrorist uh, uh, institution in the United States, which was overthrowing governments all over the world, instituting Nazi-style dictatorships, carrying out assassinations, and so on. That would have been a lot worse than 9-11. It happened on 9-11 in Chile. In 9-11, 1973, that's exactly what happened. It's in, in Latin America, it's often called the first 9-11. But it's incomparably worse than what we call 9-11. But we were involved in it, crucially. Therefore, it didn't happen. So it, it did happen, of course. Does that mean that the, the Chileans and the Argentinians and everyone else who was miser you know, affected by this have a right to come and destroy the United States? Why not? I mean, if we're allowed to invade Afghanistan because of this, why don't they have that right? I mean, you know, these are elementary questions. Uh, in a free country, you talk about them in elementary school, but they're unthinkable. Try to talk about them in the Harvard Faculty Club. People think you're insane because the indoctrination is so profound that we cannot see simple things. I mean, that's way beyond what any totalitarian state ever achieved. It is an excuse to invade Iraq which had nothing to do with 9-11. In fact, that's an interesting case, too. They, uh, uh, obviously, before 9-11 even, they wanted to invade Iraq. That was kind of obvious. They needed some kind of pretext. Well, they couldn't use 9-11 because it was blamed on Saudis, not Iraqis. So what happened is there was a massive effort made to try to show that there's a connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda now, you recall that the torture memos that came out a couple of, about a year ago, um, frankly, there wasn't much in them that isn't familiar practice. Torture goes on all the time. But there was one very interesting thing in them which was barely discussed, the reason for the torture. Turns out that what the interrogators testified, and what you find in the memos, is that Cheney and Rumsfeld, top of the administration, desperately wanted to find something that would link Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. And when nobody could give it to them, because it didn't exist, they called for more torture. Or they called it harsher measures of interrogation, meaning more torture, until you can get that information out of them. 
because if you get something like that out of them, however thin, we'll have an excuse to invade Iraq. Well, they couldn't get it because it's a fantasy, but just like the weapons of mass destruction. But you know, they had to, that. That's the core of the torture, according to the memos and the interrogators. Well, it was Obama is essentially following Bush's policy. Bush was forced in. It's you have to call everything we do a victory, so it's called a victory. In fact, the Iraq War was a tremendous defeat for the United States. Uh, you can see it. There's another thing that the press won't talk about. But at, at the beginning, of course, it was all full of noble rhetoric, like every invasion in history. You know, the Germans invaded Poland for wonderful reasons and so on. So if, yes, we were going to bring democracy and do all kinds of wonderful things. All right. As the war went on, step by step, if you look, the United States had to back down from its war, um, war aims. So at first, they tried very hard to prevent elections. They didn't want them, because elections are going to bring into power a Shiite uh, government, you know, with, probably with friendly ties to Iran, last thing the United States wanted. So they tried very hard to block elections. They were compelled to back down by nonviolent resistance. I mean, the US could kill as many insurgents as it wanted, or civilians, but it could not deal with uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the streets called out by uh, you know, a, f a fatwa from um, Ayatollah Sistani. So they finally had to agree to elections. Then they tried to manipulate the elections. That didn't work, had to back down. To the very end, when they were getting kind of desperate, they came out with the war aims explicitly. So in uh, November 2007, uh, there was an official declaration of the uh, conditions for a status of forces agreement so far. You know. And the conditions were that the United States be able to carry out combat operations indefinitely and that U.S. corporations be privileged for access to Iraqi oil. Those were the explicit terms. They were underscored to the next January, January 2008, uh, with a signing statement. It's a statement by the president saying, I'm going to disregard legislation that I'm just signing, essentially. And Bush in 2008 said, no legislation will be, and I, I don't care what Congress says, but we will not implement any legislation which interferes with the right of US corporations to have privileged access and combat operations. That's January 2008. A couple of months later, they had to back down Again, because of the Iraqis just wouldn't accept it, and they couldn't do anything about it. So they f were forced to give up and to say, OK, well, we'll slowly withdraw. And then comes a schedule, and Obama's doing the same thing. I mean, they'll partially withdraw. They'll try to hang on to anything they can. We don't know what's going on with the military bases. They're not reported. Uh, the contractors are still building them for some reason, I suppose. Uh, the United States has a huge city inside Baghdad. It's called an embassy, but it's actually a city. Uh, it's being expanded by Obama. They're not doing that because they expect to go home, you know. Uh, but uh, there's essentially no coverage of it. But I suppose Obama will be compelled, like Bush, to back down in the face of Iraqi nationalism, which is a big defeat, because it means that the real winner of the war is Iran. You know, the last thing they wanted. Uh, but you know, I can argue about how much influence Iran has, but certainly has some. You know, it's their neighbor, you know, the Shiite majority. You know, of course, it has influence. In fact, it, one of the charges against Iran now, one of the reasons why it's called the major threat to world peace, is that it's trying to expand its influence in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's called destabilizing. When Iran expands its influence in the neighboring countries. That's destabilizing. When the U.S. invades and occupies and destroys them, that's stabilizing. Take a look at the literature. In fact, the same terminology was used for Chile, to the point where a very well-known liberal commentator, James Chase, who had been the editor of Foreign Affairs, you know, pretty high up, he wrote about the uh, first 9-11, they don't call it that, uh, the installation of the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile. He says, well, we had to destabilize Chile 
in the interests of stability. And that's not a contradiction. We had to destabilize it, meaning we didn't like the democratic government, so we threw it out. But that was in the interest of stability. Stability means obedience to us. That's the meaning of the term. That's what makes something stable. Anything else is destabilizing. Like if uh, Iran tries to have commercial relations with Iraq, that's destabilizing. Okay. And this is so internally uh, internalized that when Chase says we had to destabilize Chile in the interest of stability, nobody laughs. In fact, nobody sees anything wrong with it. Yeah, of course.